All right. Here we are, Genesis chapter 45. Now, I like to always give a little bit of a summary from the previous week just so we know where we're at in the story. Of course, we spilled into chapter 45 last week just a little bit because basically with chapter 44 is when um, you know Joseph is trying to just, just keep Benjamin there and, and sending everyone else away. He, he devised that, that it looked like Benjamin had stolen the silver cup and, and let him go away and then he sent his servants you know, and, he, and he put on this whole show because he just wanted Benjamin to stay there with him since Benjamin's his brother, um, his, his blood brother. And um, So that's what happened last week and then Judah, you know, just, just really talks to him. And he's pleading with him. He's saying, you know, I'm surety for him. You know, take me instead of him. You know, his father's going to die and all this other stuff. So it gets to the point where it's, it's real emotional for Joseph. He's hearing all this stuff. He's hearing Judah plead with him and he just can't take it anymore. He can't, he can't hold up the facade. He can't, he can't continue to keep this show going on. So he finally breaks down in chapter 45, and that's where it says, Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried. So when it says he cried, all, in, in the King James Bible, when it says he cried, it doesn't mean he wept. Every time you see the word cry, it means he's like crying out. He's, 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 he's using a loud voice. So he cries out, and here's what he says. He says, cause every money to go out for me. Basically, he's talking about his servants. You I want everybody out of here. I want to be alone with my brethren, is what he's saying. He cries out so everyone could hear him. I want everyone out of here. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. He wanted privacy. He wanted to talk to his brothers in private. And then it says in verse 2, and he wept aloud. So he first he cries out. He's not crying with tears. Now when it says he wept aloud... Now he's actually weeping. He's crying. The tears are coming down his eyes. You know, he's, it's a real emotional thing. He's weeping out loud. It says, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. So they're, you know, I said last week, you know, they're probably outside the door, you know, listen and say, what's going on in there? And they hear Joseph and, you know, he's so emotional. He's weeping and he's not, he's not trying to be discreet about it. Previously, he had to go and, and kind of go in another room, you know, and, and compose himself. He wept a little bit, washed his face up and cleaned himself up and went back out. To, to keep his, his secret going. Now he's just coming out with it. So he, and these guys, you know, his brothers are probably still thinking at this point, like, what in the world is going on? Because they don't know that he's Joseph. He's going to reveal that to them. That's what this whole chapter is about. He's going to reveal himself unto them. But now he's like, he sends everyone out and he starts crying. And then it says in verse 3, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. So now it's like, they're all shocked. They couldn't even answer him. They're like, wait, what? You know, like, you're who? And you got to imagine, you know, they're, they're, they got to be looking at him thinking like, how could this be Joseph? And, and probably looking at him really close and just staring at him and just trying to analyze and start to see in his eyes what they couldn't see before because, they, you know, they're not thinking that's Joseph. But now after he says that, they're going to be looking at him and saying, Wow, this really is Joseph. And so in verse 4, it says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, or come close to me. Come here. I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now it's like, okay, you can't doubt it, because he's like, you sold me in Egypt. No one knew that. They told his father that he had died, and that's the same story that they were telling even Joseph. To his face. That's the same lie they maintained all of these years. Nobody knew they sold him into Egypt. So when he says, look, come to me, it's Joseph. You guys sold me into Egypt. Verse 5, but he says to him, he comforts him. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Joseph explains to him, he says, look, you sold me in Egypt, but don't, don't let that bother you now. 
because the reason why I even came, and Joseph understands all of this stuff at this point. You know, he had to go through a lot of hard times, but now where he's at, he's saying, look, don't let it bother you. This had to happen. I had to be sent here. And he explains how the famine that we're having, you know, these past two years, that's nothing. There's five more years ahead. And God has sent me here in order to make sure that you survive. Basically, he tells them that you. In verse um, 7, And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth. God loved Israel. God loved his children. He, he loved the family of, of, Israel, of the Israelites. And he wanted them to have a posterity. He wanted them to continue on. And that's why he's saying, you know, I was sent that. Now, of course, it wasn't just for their benefit. Everybody benefits from this because they're all able to survive and to eat and, and to, you know, make it through this horrible seven-year famine. But Joseph's trying to explain that to him, say there was a purpose. There was a reason there's a reason why this happened. God used it for good. And I like it. Turn, if you would, real quick, just to chapter 50, because this comes up again. At the, end of, at the end of Genesis, this is like, you know, Israel dies, and then his brother, his brother and now get worried again. See, they've been worried because they thought, what's Joseph going to do to us? You know, now, I mean, Joseph, at this point... He is number two in the land of Egypt, just below Pharaoh. But basically, he's running everything. He's got all the power that he needs. I mean, if he wants revenge on his brothers for selling them in Egypt and everything else, you know, selling them as a slave, he can easily get it back now. And when, when Israel dies, they're thinking like, you know, maybe he didn't come down on us because our father was still alive and he didn't, you know, he didn't want to upset dad. And so they get worried again at the, in, in Genesis chapter 50 because now Israel has passed on. He's died. And look at verse number 20. But Joseph tells them here again, because he, you know, when they're worried about it, he says in verse 20, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. And, and, you know, Joseph doesn't lose sight of that fact. He knows that he was sent, that there was a specific purpose why this happened. Now, so often in our lives, we can feel beat down. And I think one of the, the main theme that we can get from this whole story, all these chapters that cover Joseph and his struggles and everything that he goes through from being sold into slavery and being falsely accused and being imprisoned and, and being forgotten and all the hard times that he goes through. It was all for a purpose. It was all for a reason. Now, when Joseph's brothers wanted to kill him and they sold him as a slave, did Joseph have any idea what the purpose was? Not a clue. Not at all. But see, what we see in Joseph was this great example. And I preached this through the previous chapters, how he was a godly man. God was with him every step of the way. Why? Because he never forsook the Lord as God. Even in his worst hours, even when he was in prison, you know, everything that he did, God still blessed him because he was continuing, he maintained his integrity, he didn't get mad at God, which so many of us want to do, you know, when, when so many, you know, and, and think about it, I mean, even just being sold into slavery, that's pretty bad. I mean, if that were to happen to you, you lose your freedom and you're sold as a slave to somebody else? It, it, it's hard to even imagine what that must be like. I mean, we live in a free country, there are no slaves today, we don't have any of this going on. But imagine that happening to you. Where one day everything's great. You're living in your father's house. Your dad loves you. You're his favorite son. Everything's great. You have good wealth. I mean, he had all these herds and flocks. His brethren were out, you know, feeding the sheep and, and doing all that work. And, and he didn't need anything. He was taken care of, which is kind of the way that we live today. But just in one day, how fast that changed. And how easy, it's easy, you know, I'll tell you what, it's easy to serve God when everything's going great. It's easy to say, man, isn't God great? Isn't God wonderful? I'm so blessed. And praise the Lord, we ought to have that attitude. And I do have that. I praise God for my wife and my family and for this church and for everything else that's going on in my life and my job and the fact that I not have to you know, worry about going hungry and all these great things that we have and the blessings. But in one day, that can all change. 
But how will your attitude be if that were to happen to you? And this is what we need to think about. Joseph went through all of this stuff, yet he never charged God foolishly. Just like Job. I mean, Job lost everything in one day. He lost everything, yet he maintained his integrity to God and trusted in God. Even though you don't have to know what's going on. See, Job didn't even realize that it was Satan that was falsely accusing him. He didn't know that Satan was up there and, and trying to get to, to, to move God against him and all this stuff was happening. Now, he knew that, that this stuff wasn't happening by chance, but he was still leaving it in God's hands. He said, look, I don't know why this is doing this. You know, I don't have some great sin. I'm not in this iniquity that, 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 that God should be punishing me like this. But he still maintained his integrity to God and his faith, and he never, he never you know, charged God foolishly with his lips. Joseph was the same way. And this is the way that we need to be. Because I'll tell you what, life isn't always just living on, on this high and this plateau where everything is going to go great in your life all the time. We're going to hit those valleys. And it can happen when you least expect it. We need to make sure we're built up enough now when things are going well. So when these times come, we could remember Joseph. We could remember Job. We could remember these people have gone through this and just have the faith. And see, what, what is faith? It's basically you're trusting in the unseen, right? Faith is the substance of things not seen, or the, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's what faith is. Faith is, is we walk by faith and not by sight. It's the things that you can't see. It's trusting and knowing, hey, God's in charge. God, God's, God is looking out for me. I'm his child. I don't know why all this stuff is happening around me. I don't know why my life has taken such a bad turn. And hopefully you shouldn't know. Now, I'll tell you this. If you're just, just turning from God and living a life of sin and just, you just go off into some, into some real nasty sin, you might not have to wonder why things are starting to go bad in your life. If I were to go and, and just start picking up the bottle and just boozing it up and, and just going out to parties and leave my wife and kids at home and just going out to the bars or drinking. You know what? If my life starts to, starts to turn for the worse, if my family life just starts to get really bad, if my wife and I just start fighting all the time, I don't have to wonder, why are things going so bad in my life? I have to look at myself. I'm talking about the situations where there isn't anything like that in your life personally. Joseph didn't have anything like that. His brothers hated him because they envied him. They were jealous of him. He was the loved one of his father. He was doing what was right. He, they might have looked at him like the goody two-shoes. You know, he's checking up on his brothers because his father told him to. And he was doing what he was supposed to do. And they're looking at him like, oh, here comes this dreamer. Here comes Joe. Yeah, we'll show him a thing or two. But it's not because he did anything wrong or was unrighteous or anything like that or major sin. Same thing with Job. He didn't have that. So if you find yourself, you're going through life and you're saying, you know what? I mean, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in general. I know I'm not perfect because nobody is, but, but by and large, I'm doing what's right. Why is all this stuff happening to me? We need to have the faith that says, you know what? I don't know. And this is tough to do. But we need to have the presence of mind through your grief or through your turmoil, through the persecution, through whatever you're suffering to say, in the end, you know, one day I'll understand what this is all about. And it might not be for years and years and years and years to come. I mean, think about kids. There are kids right now that are growing up in homes that maybe they're being abused, they're being beaten, they're, being, you know, they're, they're having all kinds of things happen to them. They don't know why this is going on. They're being shuffled around from family member to family member and they have a really hard time. You know, people have difficult times growing up or, you know, and that could be a result of someone else's sin. But here's the thing you have to remember. God can use every single one of us regardless of your upbringing. It doesn't matter. And oftentimes, when you look back, there may be a very specific reason that, you know, that, that something happened or that God allowed something to happen. Instead of having this attitude of saying, God, well, how could you allow that to happen to me? And getting angry at God for that. We need to trust God and trust that He can take care of us even in the worst of times and and. Know that, you know, the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, 
And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, a lot of people will like to quote that verse and, and imply that, well, all things are going to work together for good. But what they don't continue to read is to them that love God, which is an important key of that verse. Because not everything is necessarily going to turn out good in your life. As I mentioned earlier, you know, if you start getting into sin, you can't just assume that everything's just all going to turn out for good when you're, when you're bringing consequences upon yourself, when you're bringing God's judgment upon you. No. But if you love God, Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And this is love, 1 John. This is love that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Keeping God's commandments is, is, is w one of the main ways that we show God our love for him. God, I love you. I honestly, sincerely respect your words and believe that, that this is true and this is what I need to be doing because it says so in your word that you've given us. I love you, so I'm going to show you that I love you and respect you by obeying you. So, yes, to them that love God, truly, not just in word, but in heart and in deed and in action, when you love God, now you don't have to necessarily love God to be saved. You just need to receive a free gift. But if you love God, you're going to be doing the works. You're going to be doing what he told you to do. If you're that type of person, the Bible says all things work together for good. And the per this is perfectly played out in the life of Joseph. Joseph loved God. We see that in Scripture. We see that he was a righteous man. You see that he, that he loved the Lord and that he was obedient to God. And it took some time. Now, it doesn't happen overnight necessarily. It can, but not necessarily. I mean, Joseph has spent years. He was in slavery. He was in bondage before God finally elevated him and brought him out of prison and elevated him to the position where he finally held as second in command in the whole country. But he had a lot to go through to get to that point. It did work together for good, but it took time. And, th and this is the part that we have problems with is the time part, right? Because nobody likes being in the dungeon. No one likes being in slavery. No one likes being going through those rough times. But we have to maintain the faith of, of, of knowing this will work out for good. I don't know when, I don't know why, I don't know how, but I know what the Bible says. I know that God says, that the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God. I love God. I'm going to keep His commandments. I'm doing what He's telling me to do. It's going to work out. And it usually doesn't work out the way that you plan, but it works out the way that God plans, and God's got the better plan anyways. Um, keep your finger here in Genesis 45, um, but flip over, if you would, to Psalm 37. I want to show you this real briefly. We've covered this verse. Uh, it was either one week ago or two weeks ago. I don't remember which, but um, Psalm 37 is, is, is very encouraging words as well that explain this same concept and, and why we can have our faith in God. Psalm 37 and we're going to start reading in verse number 23 of Psalm 37. The Bible reads, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. So if you're, if you're doing what's right, again, it's, it's, you know, it's similar to them that love God. If you're, you know, the steps of a good man, you're, you're doing what's right, generally speaking. You know, again, putting aside, I know we're not perfect, but... The steps of a good man, you're ordered by the Lord. Ordered means that God is lining up your steps for you. He's leading you in the path. You can't always see very far, but you can, you can see your next step that you need to take. God is lining it up for you. He's ordering it for you. Things are, the events may be happening in your life, and you're not even probably thinking about it, but he's moving you in a direction. This is where he wants you to go. Verse 24, though he fall. It's talking about the good man whose steps are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall. So God's lining up your steps for you. You still might fall. You still might have those hard times. Someone might, Satan might come and attack you. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. 
Praise the Lord for that. And we saw that as we were looking through Joseph's story, where it says, but God was with him. Remember, it said that more than one time. God was with Joseph. So when he's in that dungeon, that's, that's a serious fall, right? God was with him to hold him up. He was there to provide the strength. He was there to, to give him what he needed to keep going. And he'll do that for you. He says, you know, if, if, you, if you're a good man, if you, if you love God, the steps of a good man, they're ordered by the Lord. It says, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Verse 25, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. What's he saying here? He says, look, my whole life, from the time I was a youth to now, I'm old. I have not seen the righteous forsaken, where God has given up on him, or his seed begging bread. So one thing you don't have to worry about, God's going to feed you. And God's going to clothe you. He's promised to do those things unto you. He's merciful. He says he lendeth. And his seed is blessed. We're his children. You're born again believer in Jesus Christ. You are God's child. He's going to look out for you. I mean, I may not, you know, I don't have to make very much money, but I'll make sure that my children are fed and that they have clothing. It may not, we may not have the most fancy house. We may not have very many toys. We may not have very many things. We may not have very many clothes. But as their father, I will make sure that they are fed and that they are clothed. And God has made that promise unto us as his children. And I'm just a man and there, you know, there comes a point where I might fail at something. But God is perfect and he won't fail. God never fails. So these are more encouraging words here and it shows us the, just the same concept. The steps of an old man, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. All things work together for good to them that love God. And they did with Joseph. And Joseph sees it. And he ex he's explaining this concept unto his brothers of just saying, look, don't be angry because God, sent, God had a plan. I know that's not what you meant. And that's what he said in, in Genesis 50. He said, you thought evil against me. You know, it's, it's not... It's, it, and, and here's the thing that people need to understand too because... This kind of delves a little bit into like a Calvinist type of teaching where and, and, you know, Calvinism teaches that God has predestinated people to either be saved or not saved, where God has foreordained and chosen this person's going to be saved, this person's not, this person's saved, and that God has already decided these people are saved and these people are damned. I don't believe in, a God, in that God that does that. God has given us free will. God has given us a choice to either receive the gift or to reject the gift, but God doesn't make us choose that choice. God doesn't, isn't the one that has done that. And I'm not going to get too far off on the, on, you know, on the Calvinism. That's a whole other sermon in and of itself. But <clears throat> the Calvinist would say, well, see, his brothers then in a way were doing what was right because it was God's will to do evil against him. I say, no, they still did evil against him. It's the same thing with Judas, right? Jesus needed to be crucified. It, the, the, you know, scripture needed to be fulfilled, but Jesus said, woe unto him. It's better for him that he hadn't been born than betray the Son of Man because that, you know, it, it needed to happen, but the person who did it, and, and see, God is amazing with, with his plans and being able to work things out just because God is able to orchestrate things doesn't mean he's making the people do those things. See, God has foreknowledge. God knows what, we're, God knows what I'm going to eat next Monday before I know what I'm going to eat next Monday. Now, have I made that decision yet? No. I have no idea what I'm going to eat. But you know what? God already knows. Because God knows the future as much as he knows the past. So, in having this knowledge... God has orchestrated these events to happen. God, kn God knew, and, and he's able to make these, these, these pieces fall in place by putting these, you know, these, these positions in, in place for the people. You know, again, they make their own decisions, but God's not making them do that stuff. God didn't make Judas betray Jesus. He did that all on his own. But, but God set it up and put Jesus in a place to where that was going to happen. He knew it. So, you know, I, I don't want to get too deep into that, but, but having foreknowledge of something does not imply that 
he made it happen. The best way I like to explain this is saying, if I were to observe my child on a chair, standing up and rocking back and forth, right, and doing something, I could, I could have the foreknowledge to know, hey, the next time that happens, because they're getting farther and farther and farther, the next time that happens, they're going to fall over and they're going to crack their head wide open. I could have that foreknowledge, but I'm not making them do anything. But what am I going to do? I'm going to stop it from happening. I'm going to intercede. I'm going inter, to you know, intervene because in my foreknowledge I can see that happens. If I don't do anything, now that's it's what's going to happen. I didn't make it happen just because I knew what would happen. Just as much as God doesn't make people do things like Judas or whatever, even though he knew that it would happen. So that's the way I like to explain that because it's, it's a key, it's an it's a, it's a important doctrine to understand. And we can't look at these, at these brethren of Joseph as if they did anything right, because they didn't. They meant evil unto Joseph. They wanted to kill him, and then instead of killing him, you know, they just sold him into slavery. They were completely wrong for what they did. But it still needed, you know, God made a bad thing. He turned the bad thing into a good thing. And, and God was really leading him into that place. And here's the thing, you know, there's multiple ways, because we don't know how things can play out. You know, if his brethren didn't do it, he could find another way for Joseph to have gone into Egypt and to go to that place. But, but, you know, God turned it for good. And it, basically, though, Joseph's being real humble and nice and forgiving to his brethren. He's forgiven them. It's a lot to, th I mean, think about that. Would you be able to do that? To have that type of a forgiving attitude after your brethren completely turned their back on you and wanted you dead and sold you into slavery. That, I mean, that's harsh. That is harsh. I mean, I, I can't even fathom the type of rejection that would feel like your own flesh and blood, your own family, your own family, your own brothers saying, wanting you dead and then just selling you off and just who cares? Let's get rid of them. But Joseph forgave him. And he says, you know what? I, you know, you guys meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God had a plan for me. God was with me. And now here I am, and now you're going to be preserved. And he didn't hold a grudge against him. He said, well, fine. You, can, you know, Go ahead and starve then. You, know, you want to see what happens in my dreams? Well, guess what? My dreams have come true now. And you're making obeisance unto me. Now, go ahead and starve. He didn't do that. He didn't have a vindictive or a bitter attitude against his brethren. He forgave of them. He understood, you know what? God meant this for good. This is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And we ought to have that same type of an attitude. I think of uh, an illustration in my own life where things seemingly go wrong and you have no idea why. There was a time, uh, I think it was about a year ago now, when uh, I was getting, I was driving, you know, I work a full-time job, and I was driving, it was one of the days I had to drive down to Phoenix, and I'm already running a little bit late, and I pull up to the light, and my car starts to sputter, and everything, oh, great, what's going on, you know, like, battery, I need a new battery or something, and I pull in across the street, that just so happens to be in a parking lot of an auto shop. So I'm like, great, well, this is good, at least, you know, like, like I get this figured out, maybe it'll be something real quick, maybe they sell batteries, because I thought it was just my battery, and, and I'll just buy a battery from them, I'll be right back on the road again. And um, so I go into the place, and, you know, I talk, I'm talking to the guy, and he says, well, you know, it's not a big deal, you know, we don't really sell the batteries here, but we could get them for you, but why don't we just check anyways and make sure it's not your alternator? So I was like, well, that's a good idea because it could be the alternator. So, you know, uh, uh, like, great. Uh, well, how long? Well, we can actually, I said, I, need, I really need to get to work. How long is that going to take you? Like, oh, we'll, we'll get you in and out. We'll be out of here in 30 minutes. And they were super busy. So I'm like, okay, great. So I turn around in the waiting room. There's a young man sitting there. Someone that we had just knocked his door maybe uh, a, a month previous. My, for one of my friends that was with me had given him the gospel. He didn't get saved. That previous Sunday, I think it was the day before, because it was a Monday, I was going to work. Sunday, we go out to eat. He's busting tables at this restaurant. So I run into him there. He didn't have time to talk, though. So now this is the third time we're seeing this guy. Like, this isn't a coincidence. It's not, it's, not, it's not by chance that my alternator failed that day and that, and that they put me in there. Now, because I turn around, I'm like, I'd be stupid to pass up this opportunity. 
right? And he's there with his girlfriend, and I have the time. I sit down in a waiting room, and I start going over the gospel with him again. And, and, and you know what? It took a while. It took a long time. But I'm not, at this point, I'm not thinking about the time because who cares? I mean, I'm sitting there and I, I want to get this guy saved. And even if my car was done, I'd still do it. But what was really interesting is that it took them well over an hour. And by the time I was all done with this guy and, you know, him and his girlfriend had both prayed and, and accepted Christ on that day. And then when I'm done, I'm like, they haven't even said anything about my car. You know, <laughs> like, what's going on here? And then I went and questioned him. I was like, oh, yeah, like, we, we forgot. Like, we're, it's, you know, it's, it's done. You're ready to go. It was the alternator. And I was like, I mean, it's just amazing the way that it works out. And um, there's a lot of things, you know, because I was thinking like, oh, man, you know, it's, you know, I got to deal with this and now it's more money and it's time and I'm not getting to work and I got all this stuff to do, you know, in and, and, and my busy schedule and, and, and it's a really bad day. That bad day turned around immediately. Now, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, it may not always be that quick of a turnaround, right? And you might not always see why things are lining up the way they are. But God can lead you to, um, you know, maybe start relationships with people that you don't even realize that's going to produce fruit much, much later on down the road too. You know, maybe you get in an accident and maybe you have to have surgery and you go and you, know, you meet someone in the doctor's office or you, you know, whatever. There, there, there's things that can happen and, and God can make all of these events turn out in a specific way to where you can end up doing a lot of good. Because that's what Joseph did. He ended up doing a lot of good. He saved many people's lives because he was put in that position and he was being used of God. We don't know how things will ultimately turn out. So what a, the point of this is to, is to be encouraging. This is an encouraging story for us. Because no matter what bad things may happen, <clears throat> I mean, God forbid, even, even in the loss of a loved one or, or something along those lines, you know, something really tragic, we need to maintain the faith and just know God can make this work for good and, and, and use that to help you through. Keep that faith in God and don't, and don't turn on Him because you never know what He might be using. Now, and, it, and it's not always bad things that happen to us either. Obviously, we need, God, we need to have this faith and this type of encouragement when the bad things happen. But sometimes it can be good things too. You know, and what I mean by that, you know, Joseph had a mix of bad and good things that brought him to the place where God wanted to use him. So obviously the beginning with being sold into Egypt and, and being thrown into prison, those were all bad things. But then God has elevated him to this position under Pharaoh. But he still needed to maintain the right focus on serving God and not let now all of this wealth and everything that he got go to his head and forget God and then just, just say whatever. Because he was, now God had the plan for him to be used to, to save people. But through this whole time, Joseph had the free will. He could have just been like, cool, I'm going to live it up. I'm in this great position. And he could have messed that up. But, but he didn't do that. You know, he, he maintained his integrity. Turn, if you would, to Esther, because Esther is another very similar story in the Bible. Esther chapter 4. Now, if you remember Esther, I'll give you a brief synopsis of the beginning, the first couple chapters in Esther. There was King Ahasuerus. He was king over the whole land, and he had a wife that was named Vashti. Vashti the queen and she was real beautiful and he was having this big party and he says call Vashti the queen you know because he wanted everyone to see just how beautiful she was you know and Hazuerus was not a godly man he was a real proud man and and whatever but he was throwing this big party and he wanted to show off his wife and to his friends and he's like you know bring out the queen and the queen didn't come she didn't listen to him she was being disobedient so he's like you know he talks to his counselors like what are we going to do about this you know I mean she just he's the king I mean, he's in charge of everything. He's the king, and now his own wife is just disobeying him. He's like, this is going to cause a lot of rebellion. I mean, not just from the people, but they're saying, you know, the other wives are going to hear about this, and they're just going to be like, well, whatever. You know, because God has ordained that, that the, the husband is the head of the household. And he's the one that makes the decisions. And, this, you know, these, these women are going to hear what she did, and they're going to use that to, to, to cause their own rebellion against their husbands. So here's what he did. He said, okay, you know, he's going to put her away. He's going to divorce his wife and he says, I'm going to get a new wife. 
And he had this whole thing. I mean, he's getting virgins from all these different lands and stuff. And, and you know, this isn't a good story. Because he's, he's basically, like, getting them to recruit these women to come and, and audition to be his wife. And part of the auditioning was they, they stay with him a night. And each one, they brings, you know, one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. And then finally, Esther is brought in. And the way they bring him in, it's not necessarily saying that it's, that it's what they wanted to do. You know, they're, you know, he's got his people going out and finding the most attractive, the be you know, these best virgins to bring in to be his wife. Now, Esther had found favor with him, but I don't think that that's necessarily what Esther wanted to do, was to be chosen to, to go in and, and just be one of these many concubines for the, for the king and possibly become the queen. But like, when I read the story, it looks like that was not, you know, women were not lining up to go and do this. So that's a bad part of the story. That's a bad event that happened. You know, like Esther's, oh man, now I got to go here and I got to live this, you know, I don't want to do that. But she had to do it. It was, it was a bad situation that she found herself in. But you're in Esther chapter 4, look at verse 13, because then Mordecai explains unto Esther, because now Esther has found herself as queen. Good, uh, the king of Ahasuerus has found favor. He loved her. He's like, oh man, this is the one. She's, she's great. You know, I, this is the one that I choose. So she was actually chosen to be queen. But here's another instance where we see God using, you know, things in people's lives to put them in a certain place, in a certain position, in order to have influence, in order to save a lot of people. Look at verse 13 of chapter 4. It says, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? He's saying, how do you know that, that all of this stuff didn't actually happen just for this one time, for you to be here right now in this place. Because what had happened was um, Haman had, had hated the Jews. And it was because of Mordecai. You know, Mordecai would not bow down and worship any man because he served the Lord. And Mordecai was this man that he wanted everybody in the kingdom to bow down to him when he walked by. And Mordecai refused to do it because he had integrity, because he served God. So when he, he heard that, you know, like he, he hated Mordecai, he, had, you know, he really didn't want anything to do with him. He hated the fact that, that this guy would not submit and, and bow down to him. And then his friends told him, look, well, he's a Jew. Like None of the Jews do that. So he's saying this really infuriates him he's, you know, because he wants them to bow down to him. He was a proud man. And he made a decree. Basically, he talks to the king. And the king is real sloppy. He's just like, oh, yeah, okay, well, whatever. Go do whatever you want. And, and gave him the authority. And I'm, I'm grossly paraphrasing that. But go, you read the story for yourself. You'll see what he does. He gives him the authority. He gives him the ring and says, okay, fine. And what he does is says, he basically makes a day where they're going to slaughter the Jews. He says, this is the decree. If anyone wants to do this, you could do it. And basically, you just kill however many Jews you want and take the spoil and, and you know, we're just going to rid the kingdom of these people. And that's what, uh, what Mordecai's plan was. So, uh, excuse me, Haman's. That was Haman's plan. Mordecai is a good guy. Mordecai was, was the uncle of, uh, of Esther. and He was the one who raised Esther. So Mordecai heard about all of this stuff and he tells Esther, he says, look, you need to talk to the king about this. And that's the response and says, well, okay, that's great, but I'm not allowed to go in and talk to the king. He said, the only time I'm allowed to talk to him is when he calls me. And he hasn't called me for like the past month. I haven't even talked to him. I don't see him. And they're talking about a weird relationship. <laughs> she's, a, she's a queen, yet she still hasn't seen him in like the past month. But that's a whole other story. So she, you know, she's saying, and if I were to just go in unto him, I can be put to death. That's how serious it was. The only way he would have to show mercy and extend his scepter under her for her not to be put to death. If, he, if she just walks in on him because she has to talk to him, that's just death penalty. So she's you know, fearful about this, saying, look, I, you know, I, I don't really want to do this because if he doesn't grant me that mercy, then I'm just going to be put to death over this. And that's where Mordecai explains. He says, look, don't think that you're going to, because she was a Jew. She's like, don't think that you're going to escape. 
No, no. God will make sure if you don't stand up at this moment, in this hour, when, when you actually have the opportunity to do something, if you choose not to do it, God will bring that back around your head. He says, but, and this is why, again, with the Calvinism thing, he says, look, God will deliver his people. And he had faith in it. He's like, I know God is going to deliver his, the Jews. It's going to come from somewhere else if you don't do it, but that's going to, you know, destruction is going to come for you, though. And he says, and, and how could you know whether you haven't come to this place for such a time as this? Joseph was brought to that place for such a time as that famine to do good and to save people. Esther was made queen. All of those events that happened in her life, the bad events being brought into the king's house you know, against her will and, and, and being to say, okay, well, you're going to have to go spend the night with this king now. But all of that was used to this great event now where you can forget, you know, put the things of the past behind you and do a great thing of, of saving. And that's, what, and that's what happened. You know, ultimately, the Jews all got saved and were actually able to defeat their enemies because the people that came out against them, they were able to defend themselves and, and they defeated their enemies because of these people that were put into positions that God had put them in. Now, you may not ever be in the position of these, you know, these extreme high authority, but you may. We don't know. Most likely not. I mean, it doesn't happen all the time. We see a couple stories of this in the Bible, and they're exceptional stories, and they're recorded for us. So most likely not. But you will be in your own positions of influence. You will be in your own positions to help people out. And you have to realize that God can lead you and bring you to these places to help people out. So when bad things are happening to you, keep that faith and just keep moving forward and know, you know, somehow God is going to use this event for good in my life. I don't know how. I don't have to know how. But I trust that God will do that because the scripture says so. And that's the main theme of this chapter. We'll go through the rest of the verses now. But that is the main theme of what's going on in Genesis, especially with, with all of these chapters regarding Joseph. But let's look at... Um, yeah, let's go, let's go through the rest of these verses. I've got one other point in here, but I'll, I'll leave that for the end. I'm going a little bit longer than I thought. So you can't trust me when I say it in advance. Oh, it's only going to be like a 30-minute sermon because I never know how long I'm going to preach for. But um, let's, let's go through the rest of this story. So Joseph explains to them all the stuff. You know, there's going to be a lot more famine. We need to be ready for this. And um, in verse number 9, he says, Hasty, so he's a hurry up, go to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks and thy herds, and all that thou hast, and there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. So he sends this message back to his father, saying, look, come on down, bring the whole family, bring the kids, bring the grandkids, bring everybody down. You need to be here with me. You're going to live with me. I'm going to take care of you. Otherwise, you're going to come to, you know, all of your possessions are going to be gone because there's still five more years of famine. And they were already, even in the first year, they were sending to go get food. They didn't have some big storage bank of, of food at their house because they were already had to go buy it. And he says, this is going to go on for five more years. You're going to lose everything. Come on down. Be with me. Bring, you know, move in here. And he tells them he's got Goshen. He's got this nice land that they can stay at. And, and they will survive there. And verse number 12 says, and behold, your eyes, and behold, your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you and ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that ye have seen, and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. And these are his instructions unto his, unto his brethren, saying to go bring, bring his father. Verse 14, And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them, and after that his brethren talked with him. So, you know, this, this big event where he breaks down, he tells them about everything, he, you know, he's, he talks all of them now, and he's going to send them home to bring their father back. And verse 16 says, And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come, and it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. So 
They, they finally realized, because Joseph wasn't really telling anybody about this. He was telling his servants to do these different things, you know, put their money back in their sacks and put the silver cup there, but they didn't really know what was going on. Joseph kept all of this to himself. So now even his servants finally figure it out. They find out because they were, you know, they were listening to hear what's going on. And they're saying, hey, Joseph's family, you know, his brethren are here. And of course, Pharaoh was thrilled. Pharaoh had a lot of respect for Joseph. He loved the fact that he had this wisdom and he was able to save the whole land through, through the interpretation of the dream. So now he hears, well, great, his family's coming. We're going we're gonna to take care of them. Joseph's been doing a great job of running everything. And it's already been two years in. So like, it's already coming to pass. Pharaoh's seeing this that, you know, before when he put him in that position, it was still the good years. And now, just as he said, Pharaoh's already seeing this stuff come to pass. So he's thinking, like, it's proven. You know, this guy knows what he's doing. So he's saying, well, we're going to take care of his family. We're, you know, he gets all excited. Great, his family's here. Verse 17, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, lay your beasts, and go, and get you unto the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat the fat of the land. So Pharaoh's just saying directly from his mouth, saying, you, know, you come, get your family down here, and I'm going to take care of them. Verse number 19, Now thou art commanded, This do ye, take you wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Also, regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. So, you know, he says to get these wagons. You know, he's giving them a lot more than what they came with. Like, basically, send them off in a limo, right? I mean, it's a wagon, but, you know, he's, he's saying, okay, you know, go on. You know, get, get yourselves home. Don't worry about your stuff. He even says, don't worry about your stuff. Your stuff can stay in Canaan because we're going to take care of you. You're not going to need all of your stuff. Just don't worry about it and just get yourselves here. Um, Verse 20, he says, also, he says right here, Also regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. Verse 21, And the children of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the way. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. So again, he's continuing to favor Benjamin, of course, as his brother, and as his brother didn't betray him, by the way. And it's, you know, it's his, his full brother. And he's giving him five... Um, pieces of clothing instead of just one change of raiment and um, gives them some money as well. Verse 23, And to his father he sent after this manner ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt and ten she asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. That's a lot. Of, I mean, that's 20 asses of stuff. He's carrying all this food and stuff. He's saying, look, here's plenty of food. You can take your time making the trip down to Egypt. You know, come on down. We've got all of this stuff. And it's basically proving and it's also the, the abundance of what they're getting for him to believe that this, you know, Joseph is really alive. Because we'll see that here at the end that at first he doesn't even believe it. But like he sees all of this stuff. I mean, all these asses of food and everything else saying, come on down. Verse 24, so he sent his brethren away and they departed. And he said unto them, see that ye fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And you can imagine what this must sound like to Jacob after all of these years of just, just knowing his son was dead. I mean, they brought him, they deceived him. They brought him the, the coat of many colors, colors that was dipped in blood. And they had made it look as if an animal had devoured him and had gotten him and, and he was dead. That's what they made it look like. So, so that's what Jacob had in his mind this whole time. And now for them to come back and be like, no, actually Joseph's alive. Now one thing I notice, it says in verse 27, And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. It doesn't sound like they're telling him, oh, by the way, we're the ones that sold him into Egypt. And tell, you know, like, Joseph's alive. We know this because we actually didn't kill him. We tricked you when you brought you that coat. They didn't tell their father that. They probably should have come clean about that, but they didn't. They, they let him, because if they would have said that, he wouldn't have needed to see the wagons and everything else to be like, oh, okay, yeah, that must really be from Joseph. Because that's what it says here, is that 
when he, it says, and when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of, J of Jacob, their father, revived. So when he saw that, that's when he believed. Because at first he didn't even believe him. He's like, no way. He's dead. How can, you know, don't lie to me. But he saw all the stuff that he had been given, and it's just, just this enormous amount of stuff, and the wagons, and the food, and everything else. And Israel said, it is enough. It's enough. I've seen enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. They didn't bring up the fact that they're the ones that did it. But, um, you know, at this point, it doesn't really matter. Uh, probably caused her father a lot more grief anyways. But, but it's just kind of interesting because they kept that story up the whole time. Uh, all the way up until they realized they were being judged for what they did. Let me see. I have 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in my notes. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll dig in it. Turn if you go to 2 Corinthians 4 because we're done. That's, that's Genesis 45. That's the whole chapter. And you know, the main theme, though, is, is just this God directing Joseph and using him for this great moment in his life to be able to, to save people alive and, and to do this work for God. And um, you know, I know we all have different life experiences, every single one of us, and that's part of what makes you who you are. We all have a different background, and we're honestly all going to be able to reach different people. We have different personalities. You know, there's some people that, that I talk to that they just don't like me. And it's fine. I know. How could, they, how could anyone not like me? I don't know. But there's some people, you know, and it's true with all of us. You're going to rub some people wrong just, just because your personalities clash, because the way I say things or whatever, it's just, you know, people just don't like that. And it's like that with everybody. But God made us all different because there's other people that think, hey, man, you're right on, you know, we're right on line together and, and we get along great. And those are the people that I'm going to be able to reach. Or there's other people that maybe have a similar experiences that I had that I could really relate to. They could relate to me and say, yeah, man, you know, we both grew up in a Presbyterian church or, you know, like, yeah, I used to have those problems with alcohol and drugs and, and I could help you with that. You know, whatever, whatever the case may be, you know, mistakes that have happened in the past or bad things that have happened. You know, I grew up in a poor house. I had a bad father. Or I had a bad mother. They, they treated me poor. You know, whatever the case may be. We all have different experiences, different life experiences, things that we've gone through. And God has a plan for your life. And the point is, even if you've made mistakes or haven't had the ideal upbringing, God can still use you to do great things. And you don't, might not even know what those things are right now. But don't lose sight of the fact and trust that He can use you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is just a little bit more um, encouragement. Verse number 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We're going to close on this. This is the last place we're going to turn, the last thing we're going to discuss. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And this is, this, is, this is what we need to understand. He's talking about all these bad things happen, trouble happening on every side, but we're not, we're not worried about it. He's saying we're not distressed. We're perplexed. We don't understand what's going on, but we're not in despair. We're not just really sorrowful and sad and just, just, just have no clue. He said we're not in despair. We're persecuted. People are coming after us, but we're not forsaken. God's still with us. And we're cast down but we're not destroyed. God's there to, hold, to help us up. Verse 10, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Keep that in mind. You know, a lot of people like to paint Christianity as something that's just all, all roses and all pleasant all the time. But that is not the Christianity of the Bible. It is, it is going to, the Bible says, yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look at what happened to Jesus. He was the perfect Christian. He was Christ. He did everything right. Yet he was persecuted and hated and hung on a cross and murdered. It happens. But we don't have to despair about it at all. On the contrary, we could rejoice. Let's keep reading here. Verse 12, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. So you say, you know what, we know this is going to happen with us, but hey, it's, it's for your benefit. It's going to bring life to you. And this is the selflessness of the Christian life. Jesus died for us. He made the ultimate sacrifice. But it wasn't a failure 
as you know, Pope Francis was, was making it out to be a failure of Jesus on the cross. No, no, no. It's the exact opposite. It was a success. Why? Not because he suffered and, 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 and bled and died, but because he rose again and because he did it for us so that we may live. He gave himself for us. And this is the way life we you know, hey, things let, let the bad things happen. Let it happen. They'll come on to me, but but let's have the attitude where, you know what, let's make it so, you know, God's gonna make it work unto good and work unto good for others. Let's keep reading here. Verse 13. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed. And therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes. He's basically saying all the things that we do and all the things that we suffer and all the things that we go through, they're for your sakes. That the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. This, this outward skin, flesh, even though that perishes, it's the inward man that matters. That's renewed day by day. The sufferings and the afflictions that you go through. He says here, verse 17, this is exactly what I was going to go into. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He's saying the, the, the troubles that we go through now, he, says, he calls it our light affliction. Now, you think about the things that the Apostle Paul went through. He's calling that light. He, he lists off all the things, you know, that he was shipwrecked, he was whipped, beaten, stoned, you know, all these things that happened to the Apostle Paul. He says, this is my light affliction. And he says, ultimately, it only lasted a moment. These, these bad things that happen, they, they come and they go. It, it's a small period of my life, but you know what? Those small periods that you endure, that you do for he says there's a much far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. God will reward you for the, for the great, you know, the things that you suffer and the things you love and the things that you do for him and the, and the way that you put yourself out there and you get persecuted and the, 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 the troubles that you go through and you maintain your faith, God will, will reward you tremendously. Far more. The, 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 the amount that you had to actually go through, you're going to be thinking about, that's nothing compared to what God is actually giving me because of that and, and the way that, that God is, is rewarding. Verse number 18, he says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's what I was referring to, having that faith, maintaining that, that faith of the unseen, of when, you're, when you have these hard times, keep yourself strong and founded and solid because your faith is going to tell you this will work out for the good. I don't know what it's like now. I can't see it, but my faith tells me the Bible tells me, God has told me, this will work out for the good. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these encouraging words. Lord, thank you for this, this great example that Joseph made for us and for all the workings that you did in his life and recorded for us, even though they were done thousands of years ago, dear God, that we can still read about them today and they perfectly apply in our life. Lord, your, your word is eternal and timeless and we love it and we love you, dear God. Help us to maintain that faith. That is the key. When we go through these hard times and these struggles, dear Lord, help us not to forget these stories. Help us to, to keep them in the forefront of our mind, dear God, that we could maintain that faith and have that comfort of knowing that you will ultimately make these things work together for good, dear God, because we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.